This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Sunil Prakash. How are you doing, Sunil? I'm doing great. How about you, Alex? I'm doing great, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, uh, I really appreciate it. I'm a fan of many of the films that you've done uh, and have been a part of, so I'm excited to kind of get into the weeds with you about this. Love it. Love it. <laughs> So how how and why did you get into this insanity that is the film industry? <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, very early on, like I mean, I, I came from India when I was three with my immigrant parents. They were their doctors. We came in the early seventies, and really early on, like when I was seven, I saw Star Wars probably five times in the theater, and I just loved it. And I just got had this incredible fascination for films, both you know, in the theater, on uh, television. I remember watching Gone with the Wind when I was like nine years old on like some archaic channel, um, UHF or whatever it's called. And just going, these movies, like they transport you. They're just so, you know, they, they leave you like feeling better about yourself. They're so entertaining. And while my parents were always like, go be a doctor, my brother's a doctor. Um, I just was always like, I want to make movies. And my senior year, when I was an um, undergraduate at Stanford, I saw Dances with the Wolves three times in the theater. And I just said to myself, I love this movie. It moves me so profoundly. I'm going to move to L.A. the day I graduate and see what happens. And that's why I decided to come into film. That's amazing. Do you know the story behind how that script got made? Uh, Dances with Wolves? Yeah. I don't. Tell it, me. it is a fascinating. I just heard Kevin Costner tell this story the other day. Kevin was saying that he had this friend of his who was not in the business who was staying with him and he kept uh, trying to get his scripts out and he was trying to help him and he just kept saying these get, – he kept getting rejections and all of a sudden he's like, you know, it's this town's fault, problem. It's not mine. He started like bad-mouthing people that Kevin was like – you know, Kevin was opening the doors for him. And finally, the, the, uh, the he, Kevin like literally put hands on him and threw him against the wall and was like, I need you to leave my house. He moved to Arizona somewhere and was working as a short order cook. Wow. But he'd worked on this script and left it behind. And he's like, Kevin, have you read that script I left you? No, I haven't read it. I'm not going to read it. And he kept pounding him until he finally read it. And it was Dances with Wolves. <laughs> Love that. So much of it is like these weird, you know, fortune <laughs> smiling on you to get a movie made. It's it's such an impossible task in, in any which way possible. No, absolutely. And he won and and he won the Oscar for both Kevin and and, won. and and the writer got the Oscar for. It was pretty when I heard that story, I was like, man, that is just man, <laughs> that's serendipity and that's it's, it's a great story. And 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 to make, you know, it's an all time classic, you know, what a beautiful story. Yeah, it's absolutely. Good for, yeah, absolutely. Now, there's um, you, when you first got started in the in the business, you worked on as a production coordinator on Chronos. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, um, there was a girl in my senior year dorm. She was a sophomore. Her father knew a producer. He wasn't that prolific, and he hasn't done a lot since either. Really nice guy, but he basically needed an assistant. So I moved to L.A. That was the only job I got. Um, I didn't know anybody or anything, and he literally was, you know, working on this film, Kronos. So I was driving, when I was 21 years old, I was driving Guillermo del Toro all over uh, Los Angeles. Like, he was so passionate then, too. Just, you know, this was before, obviously, any of it. And I learned a lot on uh, working on that film for that year. I learned so much of this business is who you know. I, I had a lot of assistant friends um, who are assistants at the big agencies. And even the struggles that, like, my former boss and Guillermo were having even when the film was done. None of it was easy, but I just learned so much about like, you know, it's having a piece of material, getting the financing. Um, back then it was a little bit more the studios and it, it sort of set me up. I literally, after a year of that job, went off on my own to pursue finding material and, and doing it all like the, the rest of my career was, I'm going to do this on my own. Now watching, you know, get, were you on set obviously with, with on Kronos? I, I, I wasn't. They shot in Mexico, but we did prep here and we did post here. So I was like dealing with the dailies. I was very involved in every aspect of it, you know, and just it is a young guy out of college just to see how a script would like come to life on screen and the dailies and the editing. What a what a just amazing experience for me, like very early on. Very right. And, lucky to have. and Guillermo wasn't that much older than you at that point, was he? 
No, he wasn't that much older. And this was his first movie. Um, right. He worked in visual effects. Um, mm -hmm. Practical. Uh, previously, in, exactly. And uh, um, but he was just really passionate. He loved food. He loved movies. Like when I drive him around, we just talk about like all the movies we loved and hated. And I love the way he'd be like, I hated that or I love that. And it was awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, you know, at the, you've, you've done a lot in your career. Is there anything you wish you would have, someone would have told you at the beginning of your career that you're like, hey, this is going to, this is going to be this or some, some piece of advice that you wish you would have had? It's interesting. Early on, I would take every class I could to meet people because I understood that like networking was something I knew nobody here. So mm -hmm. um, through that process, I got some, I met like, like I go to a, a seminar, a pitching seminar. There'd be a high level exec from Universal. Back then, you'd write them a letter. They would, you know, meet with you three months later, you know, on their schedule. And I'd always, and, and that's where probably I got some of the best advice. I would say Nina Jacobson, who is, you know, she used to run Disney. She went on to produce Hunger Games, Crazy uh, Asians, one of the most successful producers, formerly one of the highest level studio execs. Very early on, she said to me, be the best at what you can be. Be better than everybody else. Differentiate it. Why is what you're bringing me at Universal, she was a senior vice president at Universal, going to get me excited? We have deals with so many producers. So, you, you know, we're getting almost everything we need. How do you break through the noise and have something that actually, you know, excites us or excites me? And I took that advice back then really, really, really well. Um, it worked very early on. I would almost say it's more middle of my career as I started having a little bit of success. I probably didn't understand how important marketing and, and you know, um, media, like, you know, uh, even social media, all of these outlets to help promote your movies and build your business. You know, I, it'd be more a mid-career thing about like, don't underestimate. I know a lot of filmmakers who don't wanna be on Instagram, be on Instagram. You shoot an interesting commercial, put it on your Instagram, you know, go follow, as many people as you can there, you know, don't underestimate the internet and promotion and, and media would be my biggest two cents. So now when you were jumping from being a production coordinator uh, to being an EP, which I think your first movie was Blast from the Past where you were the first yep. EP, right? I would love that movie, by the way. I remember watching that when it Thank came you. out. It was so, so much Thank fun. The, the great Christopher Walken uh, and, and a great cast. Uh, there, you know, the, the old saying is like, it's easy to be a millionaire. It's just got to make that first million. Um, it's easy to be a, a producer. It's just got to produce that first big thing. How did you get that first big break as an EP? Uh, what what I started doing after I left the job with uh, my former boss and working on Chronos, I started meeting a lot of young writers. But in the meantime, and this is sort of a crucial thing, my assistant friends at the agencies were sending me 20 scripts a week. This sold to Paramount. This sold to Disney. Tom Cruise came onto this, you know, um, Spielberg likes this script. They said, Sunil, read a thousand scripts over six months and you'll get a sense and then find young writers and find something going to Nina Jacobson's advice better than what you're reading that's already in the establishment. And I did that. I literally for every night read probably 20 scripts a night at cafes and you got a sense of what Hollywood thought was a good script. And I back then met a bunch of young writers and I started developing scripts with them and just sending it to anyone who would read them. But very quickly, um, again, Nina's advice is very good. I got really promising feedback, like high level execs were saying, this is really strong material. The first thing I sold was when I was 24, it was a script that Kurt Wimmer wrote called Second Defense to New Line. Mike DeLuca uh, back then bought it. Uh, I was partnered with Arnold Copelson. And then a year later, an exec named Mary Parent really, really responded to this old script of mine, not old, two years old, called Looking for Eve. And that ultimately became Blast from the Past. Um, so I was, I had sold Enchanted in 97. So I was doing very well setting up projects at the major studios. Like some weren't getting made, but again, it was sort of this philosophy of, you know, what does the studio already have? So why am I bringing them something that they don't have that they may be interested in? You know, it was always sort of, um, and, and Blast was the first one that got greenlit with Brendan, Alicia, and yes. I mean, just watching Sissy and Chris Walken work <laughs> back then, two Oscar winners, it was, it was amazing. I learned again so much. I was on that set every day of production. All, all my movies I've developed either from scratch or very early on. Like it's, I'm, I'm a creative producer first and foremost. Although through the years I've learned 
everything about physical production and you know again marketing your finished film is as important as making a good film but you're more in in the, in the sense of setting up with studios as opposed to doing independence or raising your uh, own money at the early part of your career in the early early part it was all studio movies um you know salt was columbia pictures again that was an old script that had been around for about eight years and we had no traction and through a weird kind of confluence of events I'd given it to Sony, who I was in post at Premonition, and they loved it. And they loved it so much, they knew that if they put even a small offer on it, other people are going to start bidding on it. So they ended up buying it, I want to say, for $2.8 million to the writer. Wow. <laughs> and uh, um, everything. You know, um, uh, Premonition was an independent film through Hyde Park, but we had Sony in for distribution early, so it really functioned like a studio film, you know. Um, it wasn't until way later in my career that I started doing independent film. Now, how did you find Enchanted? Because we had Bill on the show, uh, Bill uh, on the website. We interviewed him a while ago um, from Enchanted. How did you uh, get involved in that project? Because that's such a wonderful <laughs> film. Bill, Bill and I developed that from ground up. It was it was actually I'm sure he told you the story that it started out as like a nun leaving a convent, and it wasn't working as a nun leaving a convent. And so somewhere it became, because the whole idea, again, I, I love stories with thematic underpinnings. And we were really intrigued by this idea, again, in the late 90s. It took a long time to get the film made. But it took a, um, um, the idea that there was no innocence left in kids and kind of a modern day sound of music. But it just wasn't clicking. And somewhere we realized, like, what if it was a fairy tale character? And again, this was a spec script we developed and sold to Disney ultimately. Um, it was a fairy tale character, not a Disney princess. So once Disney obviously bought it and through the many years, um, I'm sure Bill told you he was replaced early on. And then seven years later, we brought him back, went back to his draft. And in four weeks, you know, there's the draft that was greenlit. And ultimately, um, the brilliant Kevin Lima, Kevin Lima is such a brilliant director. He obviously brought his, you know, many specific little uh, tweaks and all of that to it but it was pretty much uh, how it got made and um, like all my with the exception of you know sequels everything I do I like to develop from ground up because if you have a creative point of view from the beginning you can actually always sort of know what's right or wrong as you're going away on an instinctive level and now and now the sequel for Enchanted is is in post right now right we shot the sequel uh, in Ireland and uh, it's in post and it's for Disney plus and could not be there's something just so humbling that something we created and had such a struggle to get made back then people thought it doesn't quite fit the family model because it's really an adult romantic comedy but it's not enough of an adult romantic comedy um in the original spec that we sold and five other studios bid on it she was actually hired as a stripper like we were a little racier in the spec that we wrote you know like <laughs> obviously that has to be toned down now that you're disney um, but it's it's really humbling that the movie is a bona fide classic. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's I'm told by Disney and by just just you, you feel it out there. It's become a classic. And there's something just beautiful about that. That's why I came to make movies, you know? Yeah. I mean, my kids, I mean, we just showed it to our kids, I think, probably less than a year ago. And, and they're young, very young. And they are fascinated with it. They just loved, love the music and love the characters. And Amy Adams is Absolutely brilliant. She should have won an Oscar for that performance. She should have won an Oscar for that <laughs> performance. And uh, day two of production, I was in New York for the production as well of that. I was like, she's going to win an Oscar. And everyone thought I was crazy. The, the thing about all of these, a lot of what I work on is it is newer talent. We fought very hard with Nina Jacobson, who then ran Disney, who's lovely and one of the most, again, brilliant executive and producers I've ever, you know, worked with. Um, you know, Amy was an unknown. She hadn't had her Oscar really? nod yet for Junebug. Yeah, she was she was sort of an up and comer with a little bit of profile, but it really was a risk that I don't think a studio would take today. It, it just you know to to an eighty million dollar film you know resting on somebody who really is you know just breaking out in that kind of way. So it was fascinating at a smaller budget, sure, but it was you know we were a big budget film back then. But uh, Nina loved her audition. Her Oscar nod actually uh, happened, I think, I want to say, like, end of February, and we shot in April. I was actually in Shreveport shooting, uh, shooting a premonition, and I, that morning I was up um, because I'm two hours ahead there. Mm -hmm. And when they announced that, I was in the weight room going, wow. 
Like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> and now, some would argue, and I'm not saying this is the case, that right. the profile of putting Amy in our movie helped Junebug. Does that make sense? Of course it did. Of course. In the fall before that movie was released, so it sort of created a snowball effect. Yeah, you see that with a lot of talent that, you know, they, they have their little breakout and then they get put into a studio and just all the marketing and the everything that gets pushed into a yeah. studio movie pr raises their profile. It happened to... Um, Oh God! Uh, uh, Hunger Games. I can't carry. I can't believe I can't remember her name. Um, Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah, Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. With with that with the Winter's Bone, like all of a sudden now, she she was like, oh wait a minute, and all that press went onto that little indie film. Absolutely. Yeah, it ha it happens, no question. Now you've worked with a lot of amazing directors. What is it that you look for as a producer in a a director a caliber a, um, a collaborator as a director? I mean today. And again, I've just made four indie films at a million five budget. So the answer is going to be different than what it would have been probably five or six years ago. Um, I want a director with a real vision who's open to feedback, but also has strong opinions, you know, where it's a collaborative give and take. But I, I really do want directors like I, I loved working with Kevin Lima. He's my close friend on Enchanted. I loved working with Philip Noyce on Salt. He's another very close friend and my brilliant, brilliant man. Um, you know, directors who come to the table who bring something special and unique with their vision that I just could never come up with. You know, I don't I don't want to work with directors where I'm the one, you know, and I've never had this where I'm the one providing a vision because I don't I'm I, the, my favorite days of production, especially on location is I don't even know if I should say this is it's going so well. And at four o'clock, Sunil can go back to the hotel, work out and then go, you know, either you know, go to bed early or have a martini in the hotel, you know, bar. <laughs> yeah, you want a machine that's running so well that you don't have to be yeah. there unless you have to be there. And it's rarely that. It's rarely, <laughs> it rarely usually is. that. Yeah. Um, Kevin Lima, I actually would get disappointed when I would leave some days. I'm like, Kevin, there's nothing for me to do. It's running. I mean, it, it's just this musical number in Central Park. I don't need to watch every take. It's perfect. Like <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'll yeah. see. I'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs> I'll see you later. And I think directors, the more it's been really fun from coming. Even Hugh Wilson, um, you know, the late Hugh Wilson uh, was a good friend of mine. I love working with him on um, Blast from the Past. He, Kevin, and Philip are veteran, experienced, talented directors, and I just learned so much from them. Like they had so many you know, little tricks of the trade, so to speak. Whereas the newer directors, it was interesting to see they all kind of, and I say this with no criticism, fell into the same traps, if that makes sense. You know, like, oh, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I've, I mean, I've been directing for 20 odd years and I completely understand things that I fell into before and, and now I would never even look into. But those are things that just time happens it happens in time that you just start doing that and after speaking to so many of these you know legendary directors on the show sometimes they'll just drop some nuggets i'm like oh my god i never thought of how to direct an actor like that or how to pull a performance like that that's amazing it, it's philip noise always taught me something early on on salt which is it's not absolute and and how do i say this like you got to look at what the actor looks like what their personality is who they are as a person and then you give the direction, you know, it's, it's, it's certain actors have a face where if they say something just normal, it comes off too much, you know, like it's, it's a lot of different things. And I found that fascinating. I never have a, had a director explain that to me. Um, you know, it's like, it, it, and it was fascinating because I, I think a lot of directors think there's an absolute truth to performance. Whereas like one of the things that I would say is it's ultimately what cuts together and feels great for the story you're telling the actor doesn't necessarily like philip loved sometimes saying to the actor you know be more charming and the actor's like the, the scene isn't charming and he'd be like so you know, i don't want them to be charming but if they go charming it'll make it perfect you know it's 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 finding what you need for editing versus an academic truth and i find that really interesting i'm a little hitchcock that way too what makes the movie good versus purity is where i'm at <laughs> right exactly and you might push i, I remember talking to um uh, 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 john sales and he was talking about giving the, the actors two different motivations quietly and then let them have yeah. to battle it out without them knowing that they were battling it out yes oh. yes absolutely and 
And then you go the flip side where Amy Adams was so good. I mean, she had auditioned for the role. One of 500 girls who'd auditioned. She was perfect. She was, her audition was a home run, 10 out of a 10, which is how we convinced the studio. But she was that good every day. I've never seen like that character. It was just amazing. And Kevin was like, there's nothing to direct. It's outside of blocking. There's, I mean, she's perfect, you know? So it's also knowing when to say nothing, you know, it's all of these different, you know, um, ways of sort of, whereas I, you know, um, um, how do I say this? Like, I think the more veteran directors who've all been burned in all aspects of making a movie, the one thing they care the most about is the movie wins, you know? I think I love, uh, you know, I love the enthusiasm of newer directors, but what I always say to newer directors, make sure it's not about validation, make sure it's about the movie working because ultimately no one really cares how you feel they care if the movie works, succeeds, and all of the above, you know? Right. And sometimes you have to just uh, – when you're a younger director, you're looking at more of, like, the cool shot or the ego yeah. is, is heading where, as a veteran director, is like, I I've already proven myself. I can, Everybody can make a really cool, cool shot. Let's tell the story properly and let's make yeah. it for the best for the, move, for the film. Absolutely. Now, so out of all your projects, I, you know, as a director, you know, there's always that day – that everything's falling apart. Uh, the, you're losing the sun. The camera falls. The actor breaks a leg. <laughs> something happens. Was is there a moment in your career that you can remember, and how did you, as a producer, overcome that moment? I mean, there's always tons of challenges. I would say one of the biggest challenges is when, on a set, people start to just rewrite the script, kind of willy nilly. You know, like you'll be, and it's happened the least on salt because for a variety of reasons, but it definitely happens. And that's been always a challenge because then you like, you change the stuff and then it's not working. And then like, oftentimes I've had to come in and say, we spent so much time on the script. Why do we think in this moment, we're going to come up with something better? You know, um, it's more problems like that. I'm trying to think like, like, I mean, Enchanted was a really, really smooth shoot. Like the bigger budget shoots, you know, because there's money behind you with the studio, it's not as horrible. Um, making my latest film in Montana, in the cold, frigid mountains of beautiful Montana, there's a little bit of a freak out when like, you know, it's a whiteout snowstorm. By the way, we just shoot it. And I would be standing there in the middle of the freezing snow. Um, but stuff like that would definitely, you, you know, you have to handle it. And part of producing is also staying calm and solving the problem with a creative bent. Because ultimately, you know, on the bigger movies, you can throw a little bit of money to solve a problem. On a smaller movie, you really have to find it through your creativity. Now, there are, I mean, uh, there are times in when you're working on projects that actors or the, the politics of the set or um, the crew, there's some element that's off uh, meaning that they're either acting up they had a bad day egos get out of way can you talk a bit how to handle how what advice should you give on handling a situation of like you know set politics or things like that I mean, there's always set politics and, <laughs> you know anytime you have a group of people like this you get a certain political high school meets hierarchy right. stuff going on right. um I think the best way is honestly keep it about the creative first within the budget you have, you know, stay calm. You know, what are we trying to say? Let's get it done. You know, it, it should never be about the panic because uh, as a producer, you've got to sort of set the tone for we can make it work. Know when it's good, know when it's bad and don't let any of it get to you because there can be a lot of, a lot of politics going on on a set in every which way possible. Now, when you were working um, with like Christopher Walken, Sandy Bullock, uh, you know, Angelina, as a producer, what kind of thrill is it to work with actors of that caliber, even Amy Adams, at that caliber, just being around them and seeing them work? I mean, not everybody gets that experience. What is it like working with them on that level? I mean, let me start by saying amazing, beyond amazing. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's all of these are Oscar winning actors, you know, like they're, I'm so fortunate to have worked with so many Oscar winning actors and they're really, really good and really professional. Probably the thing I would say is that I had to learn was remember you're the producer of the movie and take yourself out of being a fanboy 
and that they're a huge star. That's something that I think a lot of people, including probably myself early in my career, you have a little bit of trouble with, you know. Um, Philip Noyce on Salt would do this thing where often him and Andrew be talking, he'd call me over and he would say, what did you think of that last take? And I would just like, by the time I got to Salt, I was sort of prepared for this. I'll be very honest. Sometimes, you know, they were disagreeing, but I, I, I didn't know who was thinking what. And he wanted my honest opinion. And that's probably, to me, really fascinating working with this cal caliber of actors and actresses. They just want it to be really good, too. That's all, you know, they're there. The, the professionalism these movie stars bring to the table is unbelievable, just in how much they care. You know, Sandra Bullock cared so much. Angie cared so much. Amy cared so much. You know, uh, um, Chris and... Uh, Sissy, all of them. It's it's Chiwetel Ejiofor, Leah, even, you know, it's, it's, and so when I meet actors today, when I see them care this much, and by the way, Alicia Silverstone cares. I just made a movie with her, her and Stephen Moyer and Drew Van Acker, they care that much. It's, it's fascinating. That's what you want, you know? Mm -hmm. They're not looking to be coddled. They're looking to be great. Right. And that's the key of working with actors of that caliber. They, because at the end of the day, it is their face on the, on the poster it is yeah. their performance absolutely up there and they want absolutely. to make sure it looks as best they, they're not paycheck actors meaning that they no, don't just it, show up for a paycheck they're there because they really care about the work absolutely and i think when you're younger or newer to the game you want to kiss up to them and it's the wrong thing to do because you're actually creating a wall once most actors i know well who have celebrity and fame the last thing they want in a professional setting is someone kissing up to them, you know, because again, they want it to be good. You know, they all know they're really good actors. They don't need a confidence boost, you know. <laughs> um, they've all, you know, had a certain level of fame and especially the Oscar winners. So that's, that's what was really, and, and just watching each of their craft in a different way. You know, um, some actors are very instinctive. Some are very much needing kind of an intellectual thing to back up what they do. Again, no Philip Noyce was really big on very simple direction on set, just more charming, a little bit, you know, keep it very simple. He would argue, um, workshop the script up till production and then just go as simple as possible, you know, get them there quickly. Uh, sets aren't the time to talk about when they were five years old, their parent abandoned them and they never liked their stepmother and, you know, the school they went to forced them to eat a food they were allergic to. Now, now do the scene, you know, it, it, it's a... Uh, <laughs> And again, there's no right or wrong. It's ultimately what works, you know, and I'll always say there's no right or wrong. It's always opinion. And I think going to your point of working with all these different actors through the years, you develop an instinct where you're almost instinctively working with it as opposed to anything else, you know? Very much so. Now, um, you've just finished doing uh, your new movie, Last Survivor. Um, and you just mentioned that you've done a bunch of films at a lower budget than you're normally used yep. to. Now, they're not all salt budgets, essentially. No. <laughs> they're probably a day or two days of salt budget. <laughs> two days of shooting salt is the entire budget of these films. Which, which, which really is interesting because, I mean, you came up at a time when the studios were basically the only game in town, really. And it yeah. wasn't – and they weren't making as many movies. And a movie like Blast in the, from the Past would get made by a studio, which – would never get made by a studio in today's never, world. Never, never in a million years would that I'm not be. sure any of them would today, to be honest, because they all had a risky factor. Even Enchanted, as I was saying earlier, it's not quite a romantic comedy. Right. But that's what makes it a family film. It's like it's it's a it's for everybody. Salt, you don't know if you're rooting for or against her, which was a bit of a challenge. Um, why it took me a minute to get that going. And it, you know, again, I like those risks. Today, studios wouldn't They'd make Salt and Enchanted, but for a third of the budget. It wouldn't be at that. Nobody, I feel, wants to take a risk. I mean, Salt had a massive budget, you know, north of, uh, like, uh, like yeah. north of uh, 100, north yeah. 100 million. Yeah, like a massive, massive budget. Um, Enchanted, I, I think we, you know, somewhere around 80 ish, 70 to 80 That's somewhere now. So yeah. these are big budget films back then. Um, and this is obviously pre rebate. So they, got some rebate back shooting in New York. The studios did. But yeah, um, by the early 2010s, I'm like, what I want to make, it's just not going to get made. Everything is changing. And like, it's very hard to get a movie made at a studio. We're developing an Enchanted sequel. We're developing a Salt sequel. You know, I had a pilot at ABC. 
I had a movie with uh, Philip Noyce and Liam Hemsworth at Relativity. And just nothing was getting made. I'm like, I'm sitting in meetings and more meetings and talking and meetings. And it got very sort of like frustrating. And I realized I know nothing about independent film. Maybe I should try it. Uh, I don't know. Um, and and that's sort of where I shifted. I still do the big ones and I still have a bunch of big ones that I want to do. But that's where in 2016, I raised a million and a half and went off and made this um charming little film a uh, gem called divorce party in savannah and like independent film is like learning an entirely new different language oh, it's just, yeah. like you know my third indie we did a hair and makeup test at the hotel little um, room at the downstairs in upstate new york and i'm like so who cleans up after this and everyone looks at me and i you know found you a back <laughs> you too <laughs> yeah like I, I was so fascinated there's just no infrastructure you know so you're and I learned so much, and um, it, yeah, it's it's a completely and, I, and I, you know, that year in 2016 to end of 2017, I then got two more made, raised money, and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even understand what you do with distribution. I didn't understand any of it, but I learned so much, and that's a lot of my life. I love learning. Every day, you learn more, and so you know, every day as I get older, I get to know more of what I don't know, and I love learning how you know new things you know i sort of mastered the studio system now it's really fun to you know do independent film right and i i'd imagine yeah i mean coming down from like you know north of a hundred million dollar budget to who's cleaning up here uh you yeah. are <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> must have been a shock but do you feel that there's you know the studios aren't doing what they used to so no. the now I, I see a lot of producers like yourselves who did have early success within the studio system and they're leveraging that success to get into independent projects. And even at the five to 10 to $15 million budgets, and at that budget, they have to be certain genres and certain stars attached to get to that point. But, you know, the $40 million movie is almost, it's almost an, an extinct. Yeah. It's only, I mean, it's that's a $7 million film today. <laughs> right, exactly. So the $40 million movie today would have been probably the 80 to $100 million film absolutely. but it has to have bruce willis in it or it has to yeah. have someone like that absolutely it's it's and there's look there's different forms of the independent world there's the foreign sales driven where you get your financing by putting a star which a lot of it is um there's some room to play around like uh in ways that i think um i've sort of learned you know all the big agencies have very very successful independent uh, departments now where they rep independent films um, my last film, Last Survivors, was represented by ICM. Uh, Spy Intervention was rep by, uh, back then it was called Endeavor Content. Mm -hmm. uh, they've broken off from WME. Um, and I even learned that, that, you know, having, if, if you can get an agency to rep your film, one of the big agencies, it just changes where you're at, you know. Um, it, it, it's, it's a very, it, it, there are too many independent, it's almost like the spec script of 1995 is the independent film of 2022. It's everyone seems to be making independent films. So there's just too many movies out there. So again, taking Nina Jacobs's advice, how do you make something that breaks through the noise? And when it does, it feels really good because you took something with zero profile, you know, zero awareness around town, um, and, and you actually start to see it catch on, it, it's just unbelievable, you know, without the marketing uh, heft of the studio. I love, I'm going to steal that quote, the, the spec script of 95 is like the independent film of today, because you're absolutely right. Before, it was impossible to make an independent film. That's why the El Mariachis and the Clerks of the 90s was such a big deal. Like, oh, you made a movie for 30000 Yes. It was the beginnings of the shift that yes. now anybody can make a movie for yeah. between five and you know a million dollars yeah. comfortably <laughs> yeah yeah cameras are cheap you're not doing it on film anymore so it's it's uh and there's and there's too many of them and i'm not saying it's easy to raise a million a million and a half it's yeah. not easy ever it's always climbing mount everest with an anchor attached to a rock always but a lot of people can you know like it, it, it's it's you know, you get four or five people that believe in a filmmaker. You could probably, and then you get the rebate. It, it's it's all doable. So there's just a lot of independent films. And I'm not sure the distributors, you know, a lot of the distributors that are very good will distribute these films, but the economics of these smaller films 
it's very tough to make them make sense. You know, right. it's, it's very, very sort of, I don't even know what to say when like a writer director will, you know, send me a script and say, Sunil, I know this isn't for you, but it's a lovely romantic comedy over 24 hours of people who meet at a cafe quirky. And I want, I've raised 400,000 and you're just like, but it's going to be very, very difficult to get to recoup unless it plays at a major festival but you're not known. Your short didn't play. Like it's 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 all. I'm not. It's this weird thing that I always say. Like it's impossible and doable at the same time. And going back to your what advice would I give? That is what I'd always remind people. It's totally doable and possible, juxtaposed with it's impossible. And remember that. And it, it's that thing Linda Ope said in her book: Don't ride a mule backwards or a horse backwards. You know look at the marketplace and understand how you're competing within that marketplace. I mean, I always give advice to filmmakers in regards to budgets. And I'm like, look, oh, I got a $3 million budget. I'm like, every dollar that you go over a million dollars in today's world is it's it's, it, it's going it, to get it to recoup that money, not to make a profit. To recoup yeah. that money is so difficult. Adding stars helps, certain things help, but then – you got to make sure your pro proper distribution channels because if yeah. you go into the wrong distribution channel, you'll never get paid, and so on and so forth. So you're, I mean, you've been playing in this field now for a little bit. While you're still, you know, yeah. you're still dealing with the streamers yeah. and building other projects out there. Is there, is there any advice you can give to filmmakers about how they can raise money at the? Did you say like a one point five million dollar? Because that's a sweet yeah. spot kind. That's a sweet spot kind of budget, depending on the genre and talent attached. I think you've got to put a lot of effort into making sure your project is unique, not just more of the same. I read way too many scripts sent to me by newer directors. It's not that they're bad, but they're sort of linear thrillers that you've seen before that really are a $10,000, $50,000 film. And they'll like look at No Country for Old Men, but that was the Coen brothers, you know, like <laughs> it's, it's quadruple standard. It's like, you know, what people who have established track records can do is not necessarily... And I'm not saying that in a bad way, but make sure your script is differentiated, elevated. I would probably say, which I didn't fully get early on either in my indie when I did this, but I've learned it now. Make sure it can play at some festivals, you know, um, don't try to compete with what the studios are doing. So don't try to make a million dollar visual effects film that competes with the Marvel movie because you're not going to win, you know, mm -hmm. make it more where you barely see the alien. You know, it's almost like two eyes. That's it. Really artistic. That would be my advice. And then that, get a really good teaser, rip reel made or a teaser or shoot footage, but make sure it's really good because I get a lot that honestly are just okay. You know, they're, good isn't good enough. And then honestly, you got to get someone within the business. You got to get a cast, someone attached. That's how you raise money. Even on the indie level, you know, um, I've made three movies with an actor who I really love working with, a guy named Drew Van Acker. He was on Pretty Little Liars. The first film, uh, Lifelike, that, you know, um, we met with, we loved him, we put him on. The financing was a little shaky. He laughs right now because he's like, he thought he came on to a finance film. But indies are always a little eh, like, but once he was on, it was not that hard uh, to raise it because they're, you know, it's a, it's a huge show and everyone's daughter who we went to, it's like they're obsessed with it and him. And so it was get a cast. And again, that budget was, it was a million budget, million two, somewhere in there. Um, you know, a big amount of that budget came from the New York rebate. So when you're trying to just raise 600,000, it's not the hardest thing to get three people who want to get into film to put 200, 200, 200 with a cast. It's, it's cast, but start with a piece of material and visual stuff, a visual uh, reel that really excites people. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's probably for me the biggest... And again, I'm not trying to, you know, anyone I know seeing this, I'm not talking about you, but I just get a lot of stuff that's fine. It's good. It's. I mean, it I think the, the conversation is like good is not good enough. Great is the beginning of the conversation. Yes. And, and you're competing yes. with other greats. Uh, other yeah. gr but that's that's the start of the conversation. That's not the that, that's where the beginning is. And I many people f understand that like, oh, this is a really good script. We've got piles. I've read thousands of scripts yeah. that yeah. are it's, good. I've read are good great scripts that i'm like this put in this guy's hand or this gal's hand as a director and put this cast in that's an oscar winning script like you it's so good i'm sure you've read those as well absolutely absolutely and again why is it unique because you do need agents and managers you've got to get a piece of cast into it in my humble opinion 
um, before you're ever going to really have money locked in. I mean, that's probably every independent film. It's probably every studio film, too. No one really makes a movie without knowing the cast, unless it's uh, an IP like Hunger Games or Twilight or something. Right, and and, there, and there's a difference between a uh, backyard independent like Richard Linkletter says, like if you're going to yeah. go make your backyard independent for five or ten or twenty thousand dollars, that's a whole other conversation. Do whatever the hell you want yeah. at that budget. Whatever the hell you want. Yeah. It, it, make art. Right. <laughs> it's it's I I I I've met with lately a lot of filmmakers, and especially um, after the, sort of Last Survivors, I'm getting a lot of indie filmmakers coming my way as well. And again, <laughs> what I'm seeing is some of them make interesting first films, but again, they're micro budget films that played at festivals even. The material thereafter, I just wish it was more differentiated from everything else. Never forget the marketplace is probably my best advice. You know, I think it's very easy to get into this mode of, oh, if, you know, if, if you know, Chris Hemsworth read this, I know he'd love it. It's <laughs> if where, Tom Cruise and Will Smith joined forces, this would be an amazing movie. Yeah, they would get made. <laughs> I've had so many people tell me through the years, like, Sunil, I know if Angelina read this, she would love it. And I'm, I, I, it's like, I don't want to get into it with them, but you don't really know her. You know her from interviews, you know, like it's, she, she's a lovely, lovely person, but there's, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot tougher to get cast and get it going. And then once your movie's done, make sure it's good. Once that's done, you know, make sure, like, if you're not an editor, maybe don't edit your first film, you know, like give up a little bit of the control. Like, you don't have to be de- directing isn't dictating. It's making a great movie and know when it's all your stuff. And if there are days you're wrong, admit it. You know, those are sort of my things I've observed. Now, uh, so tell me a little bit about uh, we've talked a little bit about your new movie, The Last Survivor. But how did you get that one off the ground? And I love that you brought back Alicia from Blast yeah. from the blast. literally Blast from the yeah. Blast. And she's now back yeah. in this one. What a hell of a, a circle that you guys mm-hmm. made. And it, it's it's um it, it's such a hell of a circle. It, it's um and, and what a pleasure to work with her. She's so good in the movie, and um, uh, it's another script I developed from scratch with the writer. He was fascinated with um, preppers, and we sort of came up with this idea, which I thought was fascinating about like the idea of again I'm giving a lot away here, but a metaphorical apocalypse you prepare yourself for. That um, without giving too much away about the movie. There's some reveals at the end of Act One, but it became a story about a father raising his son and a son's kind of affair with another survivalist living off the grid and how that threatened the little utopia they were creating. And the script always right away, like the studios really liked it. I I had a lot of love for the script at a very high level, but it was again at that time in 2017, 16, 17, somewhere there. This kind of genre film isn't really made at a studio unless like an a, a Guillermo del Toro wants to do it or someone really big. But you're not getting the biggest director in Hollywood to do an unknown writer's first script, you know, that's an original script like that. So um, ultimately, I just finished Spy Intervention. I really enjoyed uh, Drew Milray's enthusiasm. I gave him a bunch of my things. He loved it. I gave it to Drew Van Acker. He loved it. And that's where we sort of came together. And it was Alicia's UTA agent who thought it was one of the best scripts he'd read, sent it to her, had her meet. She loved it. I'd actually met Stephen Moyer at a table read on Salt when it was Tom Cruise. It was a male before it was a female. So um, they both were really passionate. And, you know, we had a little ups and downs to the financing. Then the pandemic put it on hold. But then it kind of came together. And we had a little window in December. And I scotch taped the financing together, as I put it, you know. And there we were in Montana. But I'll say I made three indie films. So on this one, it was like, you know, we were very aware of production value and, you know, making sure we had everything we needed. We hired, you know, Milray was great to work with. He edited Spy on his own. He was like, I don't think I should edit this one. We got a veteran, young guy, but a veteran editor who just come off Palm Springs, you know, but really, really good editor who... And again, editing isn't what a lot of young directors think it is. It's never about the shot. It's about the story and the characters Pace. and the performance. Right. And that's the problem. And, and, and again, um, Neil Travis, who won the Oscar for Dances with Wolves, edited one of the editors on Premonition. He would edit um, almost like playing a musical instrument. he just look at the footage and there'd be not a rhyme or reason. And he'd go to these things and it would come together with a beautiful lyrical way to tell the story but it wasn't like thought, like, I like this shot, and then I'm going to go to this shot. 
and that because he learned back on film where you had to figure it all out magically in your head otherwise you're splicing forever that's what bradley was and this movie was you know we got you know i jumped on a sword with a color correctionist with all these different people to like really make sure we made this movie you know it's a it's a modestly budgeted film and i learned from my other three films look they've all done okay um one sold a lion's gate the other to synodyme but i wanted this one to impact knowing what i knew now versus then um, and we were just, I mean, we were so fortunate to world premiere at Fright Fest. They flipped over the movie um, in Leicester Square in London. We played at Leeds International Film Festival. Vertical, um, a top boutique distributor, came in in a very, very real way um, and swooped it up. And we're, you know, the cast loves it. Alicia, it's one of the great pleasures of my life to work with her again. She's one of the sweetest most talented joys, as is Moyer, by the way. This was a cast, and, and Van Acker, he and I are, you know, we're good friends. We're doing a bunch of things together in the future. It was sort of a dream to see this cast come, and, you know, they all had triple bangers, little tiny trailers that, you know, is not really enough for, you know, anybody. Um, the conditions, tough shoot in the <sighs> ice cold, you know. Uh, you know, the, the, there's a scene in a cop office where that was a you know, a, a empty building where there's no heat. We were in 30 degrees indoors and I never got complaints from any of them. You know, it, it was beautiful to see them really roll their sleeves up to do an independent film. And that's another thing I would say is make sure you have a cast there who understands what they got into and gives it their all. Yeah, because if you if because if you've got someone like your like an Alicia Silverstone who was, you know, maybe she was used to Batman level budgets yeah. and she shows up like what what why do i have a triple bank what, what's going on here like what, why is my where's my latte if you have someone like that who's not aware of the situation they're going into why is it so cold what's going <laughs> which happens yeah. if and if you don't do that properly you that kills your movie it kills your movie and even when the movie come, is finished like they understand that like it all rests on us banding together and promoting it van acker and moyer actually went to the world premiere in london Alyssa was shooting her film with uh, Benito del Toro and Justin Timberlake, so she couldn't, but she did all the press back. You know, they were all so supportive, which is beautiful to see. You know, an indie film is like planning a dinner party with people you love. Like, if you put the love in it, you can get very far. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all my guests. Uh, I think the first question you've answered the the advice that you would give a filmmaker. We've t we've talked about that at, uh, a bunch. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? let go of your ego i mean i've learned it years ago but let go of your ego it's a uh um always remember humility and you know you know as long as people deserve it just never make it about your ego and uh three of your favorite films of all time there's so many but you know dances with wolves star wars terms of endearment titanic schindler's list color purple rear window i mean that's you know, I love movie movies, you know, I'm probably not the indie guy, although I, I love, I love independent film, but like, with a little bit of a, you, you know what I'm saying, like, I love world building in film. Right. And that's one thing you did with Last Survivor so beautifully. It's I mean, that does not look like a $1.5 million movie. I mean, the, the production yeah. value because you shot in Montana, and you have these vast looking things it does add a tremendous amount it's a lesson for everyone listening like if you can get into nature it adds a lot of production value to your movie it it's montana was it, it, like shoot there it's beautiful but we had a dp who really he came from peru and this is a good example of a minor thing where it's a brilliant dp julian knew what he was doing he needed this wanted this he loved it he wanted to come to the u.s and do this find the right dp i think a lot of first-time directors always have their best friend who's a DP. It's very common. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing because you know, I mean, it's like, it's of course, it's yeah. a cliche. Don't put your best friend on. Don't put your friends on your movie. This isn't, again, it's not a social thing. Um, really good production designer, Sam uh, Neidenbach, who, again, first feature, and, and Mona May, who did the costumes on Clueless and Enchanted, she brought really good costumes to the table. And we just had even hair and makeup, like really art... We had artists who didn't care about what they're being paid and they understood what they were doing and they loved it. And that's so important. So what you're saying is don't hire a DP who, that, who just started uh, started lighting because they own a red camera is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or because they're your good friend and you, you know, it's the first time you're leaving to go on location. And it's a lot of 
you know, just, you know, again, working with like Philip and um, um, Robert Ellsworth shot Salt. So it's like I, I've worked with some of the <laughs> biggest and best DPs out there. Um, make it about the movie first. That's the biggest thing. Even when I was younger on Blast, like Alicia laughs. She doesn't remember me that well or at all. I show her pictures. I was on set. But back <laughs> then I was probably a little bit like so into this in my first movie. I'm with big stars. And you don't get what you need done, which is focus on the work. And it's a hard thing when you're younger, your ego, your self-esteem, wanting validation. But focus on the movie. It's all about the movie. And the validation will come years later. And now then where, you get the validation, it bores you. <laughs> now, where um, and where can people watch uh, Last, uh, Last Survivor? Last Survivors is playing on all – it was in, in 10 cities theatrically, but it is on every digital platform. iTunes, Amazon, you name it. And uh, – you know, it's again, we, um, Alicia, you know, she's been all over uh, promoting the film. It's just so great to see a little film getting this kind of impact. I have, it, it's, it's, um, it, it makes me want to just, you know, get the next one up and running and, and, you know, do it all again and even more. <laughs> and um, what, where, and what's up next for you? Um, uh, obviously, Enchanted 2, Disenchanted is coming out later this year. I've got a movie, another movie with um, Van Acker. It's a very cool science fiction film with this cool director who directed a Super Bowl ad and a short one at Palm Springs. Van Acker and I have another movie with Alan Richson. He stars as Jack Reacher. He is a very, very talented director. And we have a movie with him uh, that he'll direct, co-star with Drew, that we're getting ready to let go out with as a package. Um, you know, and then further stuff down the road. But that's sort of the, the, the back home and travel back east are sort of the two next ones and then disenchanted coming out later this year my friend you seem like a busy busy guy and you look like you love you, what you do so uh i appreciate you coming on the show and dropping your uh, your little knowledge bombs on us today so i appreciate that my friend and uh you know thank you for having me it's been a